Welcome in, folks. Got a bunch to react to in this one here today here on the Reaction Channel. First up, SoFi CEO went on CNBC, spoke about the business, what's going on here. I think it's very important because what Anthony Noto believes is going on out there is very different than maybe how the stock price is reacting. C3 AI, that stock's absolutely collapsing here today. I want to go ahead and react to uh, Kramer's take here and kind of share my opinions and perspectives there. Fed should, do, uh, should cut rates 50 basis points in September and should return to neutral. Says this gentleman from JP Morgan, want to react to that one, kind of share my opinions and perspectives here. Three stock lunch, Target, Exxon Mobil, Top Golf. Looking forward to reacting to that one. Top Golf's a stock that's been destroyed. Well, it's them and Callaway together, so that one should be interesting. Managing the, the Nvidia trade, I want to react to that one. I think that's interesting. Trump will lower corporate tax to 15% for companies that make products in America. I think we're going to, I think it's an important subject we speak about. How practical is this? Is this likely to happen? What's it mean for the stock market? What's it mean for certain stocks? We'll speak about that. And uh, that's about it. Okay. Appreciate you guys being here as always. By the way, over Labor Day weekend, I released this video that could be very helpful to you, a lot of you guys. 16 years of stock market advice in 52 minutes. That came out over Labor Day weekend, so not a lot of people got to see that one, but very helpful video. All right, guys, let's react. Tech space, SoFi CEO Anthony Noto. Welcome back, Anthony. It's it's good to have you. What what are you seeing on the delinquency front? Well, sir, thank you for having me, and I appreciate coming on there. In terms of consumer activity more broadly, and then I'll talk specifically about the credit card business. Consumer activity and sentiment is trending okay, and I think as long as the Federal Reserve cuts rates twenty five to fifty basis points, uh, that trend will continue. A couple of data points that we're seeing that should be instructive for the audience is what's going on with the SoFi member. Again, a SoFi member is a higher income member, higher credit, but it is indicative of some part of the market. We're seeing debit spend. So that's very important right there. He, he basically categorizes SoFi customers as higher income and higher credit scores, right? And I think that's very important because SoFi, they price this stock. Where do they price this stock? They price this stock like it's like going to be like a BK... It's a bankruptcy risk type company in a recession, right? That's the way they price it. I'm just going to call it the way I see it, right? I mean, the stock's been fluctuating between $5 and $8 for a while now. What other bank stocks are fluctuating around 5 to $8, right? That's basically Wall Street kind of saying, oh, you're a big risk. We don't know about you because we know the growth is there, right? Do we not? Like the growth is amazing at SoFi. And Anthony knows, like, you guys realize, like, we're, we're higher up the rung than these other banks in the loans these other guys are providing. But you're going to value us at these joke prices, right? So I think that's a little, something very important to kind of keep in mind here because, yeah, man, I, the, the SoFi valuation is pretty, pretty comical. To be very strong, it was strong in Q2 and continues to be strong in Q3. But importantly, that debit spend is not coming at the expense of deposit growth, which also remains strong. The second data point I would share with you is in our invest business, we saw about 50% growth in net flows in Q2 in our assets uh, in our invest business with a lot of interest in alter alternative assets, which we launched at the beginning of the year, but diversified uh, investments like ETFs and robo. And we're seeing strong net flow growth again in, in Q2, Q3 as well. And then on credit cards, to your specific yeah. question, our portfolio is quite small. It's growing nicely. Um, we are seeing improving entry rates into delinquency. We cited in Q2 that we saw a 20% improvement in entry rates into delinquency compared to 2023. And we're seeing continued credit performance trends in line with expectations in Q3 in credit cards as well as personal loans, which is a good outlook. So when you see the Very market throw a big fit like we saw yesterday on worries that maybe they're not pricing the recession as much as, say, the bond market, what, what do you think? It doesn't, it doesn't sound like you're seeing any kind of big red flags. Well, I, I'd say two things. One, we do have a higher income customer, and they also are higher in credit, so they're not going to be fully representative of the broader market. A subprime customer would be experiencing different trends, and even middle America would be experiencing different trends. But I do believe what we're seeing is a piece of the puzzle. Um, if we don't see Fed action of 25 to 50 basis point cuts, then the concerns on the macroeconomic front will become a reality and we will go into a recession. But I think the Fed understands the importance of important. uh, the cuts that are coming. I hope they move with 50 basis points. It gives them more optionality. It'll be yes. more impactful of corporate America and it will definitely. Thank you, Anthony Noto. We are on the same exact wavelength, are we not, right? I've been telling you guys that they need to come out. Do a 50 right off the bat here. Do another 50 at the end of the year. 
get us down 100 basis points, and then we'll see where we go from there in 2025. So we're on the same... More impactful for the consumer. And I think waiting to move that amount could be taking more risk than is necessary, yep. given where unemployment is trending and given where we're seeing things like Joel's report today. Hey, Anthony, it's Carl. Uh, this week, the and journal... the gap did... between Fed funds rate and the CPI, it's a ridiculous gap there. I mean, it's insane. It's on how Americans and how good the journal argues they're feeling about their 401ks. We've seen the number of million dollar 401ks at Fidelity. I wonder how you think your consumer is thinking about their equity gains and how reliant they are on this so-called wealth effect. What would happen, for example, if, if we had a severe correction? That's fair. Yeah, so far, we're not experiencing spending due to wealth effect. We're, ex we're seeing spending based on income. Um, debit spending and deposit trends are the first indication of that. If asset growth slows, then we'll, in fact, start to see some risk in debit spending and deposit growth. Uh, but right now, asset flows have continued to grow as people have gotten good returns, both in their 401k and their discretionary um, investing as well. So think of it as a ladder effect. First, net flows will slow and go negative, uh, and then you'll see a decline in deposit growth and then a decline in spending. And right now, we're actually seeing an improvement in net flows, improvement in deposits, as well as spending. So I don't know how anybody could walk away from watching that interview and not be insanely impressed by what SoFi is doing, what their business model is up to, and just very impressed with Anthony Noto. He's ready for every question. He's going to explain to you exactly what's going to happen, what's going to transpire, why it's going to transpire, right? I mean, that's top-tier stuff, top-tier stuff. And, um, I mean, other than Jamie Dimon, I, I got the most respect for him of any – uh, but he really in the banking system right now. Lloyd Blankfein, who used to be at Goldman Sachs many, many years ago, I had a lot of respect for him. He's, he's long gone from Goldman nowadays. But um, phenomenal, man. I mean, just, I mean, it's hard not to be a buyer of so SoFi stock, right? All right, next one up here, C3AI. They've become very much of a meme stock. Kramer's mad dash as we count down to the bell. Yes, Carl, there was a company at one time that had been, become very much of a meme stock, and that's C3 AI. People felt that it was the uh, best way to play AI. Well, if that's the case, people are now beginning to wonder whether that is such a good idea. Tom Siebel last night on John Fort, uh, it's CEO, he tries to talk a pretty good game, but at the same time, he has a subscription business, and the subscription business had lumpy numbers, uh, and also the billings, but let's just say, what happened is, is that they, if they were so good, why didn't they guide hires the way that the, that the theme was on the call? I found the analysts combative. I felt Tom's, Tom uh, Siebel, who was an old hand, handled it just okay, basically saying, we, enough already with that. And, uh, and the analysts don't play that game. You can't have a sequential quarter-to-quarter -quarter decline in billings and expect people to buy into all your positive rhetoric. It was a painful call. I think Tom's terrific. Painful call. Do you think this is a precursor to some estimates coming down, some revisions happening? Yes. Yeah. And I also think people, last, once again, we're in this world ever since the NVIDIA call where everyone's questioning anything AI. And if you have AI in your title, obviously, uh, hmm. it's a non-starter. Versus, say, GitLab, which was up very big the other day, and that had very good AI numbers. But people are going through AI, positive, negative. Don't forget, tonight is Broadcom. And there was an analyst out today from Evercore who said, buy it in front of the print, meaning buy it ahead of the conference call. I was going through some of his other things, and he said, buyer, you should buy into the NVIDIA July quarter print. That, that was um, not a good idea. So I, I want this fellow to go one for two because my capital <laughs> trust owns it. But be aware that there's just a lot of game playing, once again, about a big quarter tonight by Hoctan and Broadcom, which is smack in the wheelhouse of AI. So uh, this is very important, right? This is very, very big here. First off, Palantir, even with these whole, the massive move down in C3AI stock today, the stock's getting absolutely wrecked. Even with that massive move down, Palantir, down 1%. Down 1%. And that's on a day when the market's red, right? Dow down, Russell down. We got the NASDAQ probably going to be down by the finish here and the S&P 500 down. And yet Palantir is only down 1% on a red day with C3I getting destroyed. That's phenomenal. Second thing is 2024 is really the year you're finding out who's real AI and who's just got it in their name, 
right? And uh, the stock price is very self-explanatory. C3AI stock's down 26% this year, while Palantir stock's up about 82% this year, right? A massive divergence between those two companies. And so we're, we're beginning to really find out who's real AI, who's just got it in their title, who's just talking a big game, right? And um, last year, that was okay. Last year, you could get away with just being a salesman and, and selling AI, right? This year, <laughs> we're, we're finding out who's really got it and who doesn't. And Palantir's actually real deal. Holyfield, C3AI wasn't even an AI company for the longest time. Like, you could go back to that company's history if you want to do some real digging on it. They weren't even a, an AI company for the longest time. Then all of a sudden, you know, some people started talking about AI. They switched their, their name, right? And then we went into this bull cycle around AI, and they definitely benefited from that in terms of their, their name title and people buying the stock. But you've got to do more digging on what the actual businesses have. All right, next one up here, Fed, Fed should cut 50 basis points in September. Joins us now. So, so given the backdrop and all the new information we've received this week, should the Fed go 50? In September? Well, that's, that's what we think. Uh, we think there's a good case that they should get back to neutral uh, as soon as possible, a neutral policy setting, which, you know, is probably at the highest, something like 4%, which is 150 basis points uh, below where they are now. So we think there's a good case for uh, hurrying up in their pace of rate cuts. On the other hand, I don't know, services was not too shabby yep. this morning, still, still an expansion. Jobless claims continue to point to lack of stress in layoffs from corporate America. So 50 might be uh, an overreaction to what is an economy that's clearly softening but not yeah. collapsing. No, I, guess, I think that's right. Uh, if they wait till it's collapsing, I think that's waiting too long. So we think- Yes, that exactly. That's the thing people don't understand. You're seeing every single trend go extremely negative right now, except for the unemployment rate, right? The unemployment rate is ticking up, but it hasn't gotten to scary levels. Listen. Like people just don't understand anything about economics. The Fed lags. When the Federal Reserve starts raising interest rates or lowering interest rates, there's a one to three year lag there. And you can look back at every previous cycle and you're gonna see those Fed lags that last one to three years, whether you're raising rates or whether you're lowering rates. So assuming the Fed's about to start cutting rates, these rate cuts really won't be felt likely until 2026. 2026, that's a long dang time from now. A lot can trans transpire in the economy in the next year, year and a half before these first cuts start to actually positively affect the economy, right? And then let's imagine, I mean, the Fed's probably not set up in a place where they're going to lower interest rates substantially until what? Probably late next year. Let's say late 2025. You're talking about the, the, the real positive effect of lowering all those interest rates won't be felt till 2027, likely. 2027. What can happen to the unemployment rate between now and 2027 if the Fed's far too restrictive and you have an economy that continues to, let's say, weaken over that amount of time? That's why you got to get out in front of this stuff. You can't wait till it's right in front of you. You wait till it's right in front of you. You end up in panic mode. Next thing you know, you're cutting 75 base points, 100 base points, 200 base points, and you got a whole mess to clean up that takes years to clean up, right? We watched that play out in the great financial crisis. The great financial crisis, the Fed started to panic. They lowered rates left and right, right, in 2008 into the beginning of 2009, down to 0%, which was something a lot of people didn't think the Fed would ever do, go down that low, right, all the way down to 0%. And yet, when did it start positively affecting the economy? You didn't really start to see the positive effects of all that cutting in 08, 09, really until like 2011, 2012, right? It was a process. It took years to finally like, oh, you know, this is, all those cuts that we did years ago is finally starting to help. That's what's important to understand about this, right? And, and uh, it seems like people sometimes don't get that through their head. And I'm like, dude, like, whew, you're going to miss it big. You're going to miss it big if, you, if you're messing around like this. Case, as I said here, to get ahead of this, uh, you know, any further weakness. Uh, so Thank you, sir. Moving soon seems, uh, seems to us like the right thing to do yeah. here. Mike, how do you do 50 and frame it in a way that minimizes the market sense of panic? What would that sound like? Easy. We're far too restrictive right now. We're looking at a CPI that's in the twos. We're looking at a Fed funds rate that's 5.25 to 5.5, which is we're in far too restrictive a territory, and we need to move considerably in a direction that is more toward neutral. Boom. Is the market going to get scared about that? No. You just laid it out. If they freak out over that, they're clueless. They're clueless if they freak out over that. You're just laying it out. CPI's in the twos. We're at 5.25, 5.5. 5 
we're way too restrictive. We need to start moving in a direction that gets us to neutral. And we feel like a, a good amount to start moving is 50 basis points at a time. I, uh, you move 25 and people are like, what are you doing? Like, like uh, why are you scared to move? They move 25, people are going to say, you know what I'm going to say? Why are you scared to move? When you're far restrictive right now, there's no concerns at all about inflation at all. We're not seeing anything in regards to inflation outside of insurance. That's it. And that was only because insurance was playing a catch up game because of how much real estate went up and how much car prices went up. Right. Outside of that, you're not seeing the inflationary pressures. The commodities market is not showing you anything. So you've got to get moving here, man. You've got to get moving to neutral at least ASAP. So I think Powell's done a good job of explaining so far why they've done the things they've done. And I think if they're moving back to neutral, that's not saying they're panicked. It's saying they want to address both growth and inflation risks more, um, <clears throat> more adroitly. What, what is your so sense? He kind of said what I said a little bit, just not as cool. Of, so the whole <laughs> you know, softening versus collapsing, the, the market has become very obsessed. And as I mentioned, hypersensitive to the idea of a growth scare. H how fast do you see this unraveling? So we don't think things are unraveling, right? We have an unemployment rate that's been drifting higher. We have job growth that's moderating. Uh, and that doesn't call for, you know, getting policy rates down to three or two percent. But we do think there's no longer a very strong case here to keep policy rates, you know, very restrictive because inflation has, exactly. you know, come down quite notably. Uh, so the, you know, the, the rationale, I think, for staying very restrictive has gotten weaker in recent months. And I think you even saw that as recently as, uh, you know, in the July, uh, July FOMC meeting, the case was already being made by several uh, participants then for easing policy. So. Uh, again, I don't think this is a, an issue here of um, the economy collapsing. If it were collapsing... Exactly. It's not unraveling. It's not collapsing, as he points out here. But could we get to that place six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, if the Fed moves far too slow, stays far too restrictive? Absolutely, you could get to that place. That's the major risk, right? It's not that it's happening right now. If it was happening right now, the Fed would be already in panic mode, cutting rates to, to zero. It's about... You know, all the signals kind of starting to tell you, oh boy, we might have problems ahead if the Fed doesn't get moving here, right? Uh, I think you'd have an argument for going more than 50 uh, 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 at the next FOMC meeting. So I think this is really just getting back on sides. Yes. And then, you know, if they have to raise, uh, there's nothing wrong with reversing course. Uh, but we think, you know, Chair Powell has, as I said, been a very good uh, communicator, uh, even when they've changed courses, you know, pretty, um, pretty rapidly over the past couple of years. In hindsight, that was, uh, you know, a correct decision when they got, you know, quite a bit more hawkish than they had been. Uh, Powell was able to explain that. And I think if they have to do, you know, the opposite right now, I, I think Powell, as I said, has been a very good um, communicator. And I think he could, uh, you know, talk to the market uh, and talk to the public, more importantly, about yeah. why it makes sense to be, um, you know, in a more in a setting that can address uh, developing risk to either uh, inflation or... I mean, he really needs to talk to the market. The public's not even going to care. The public's not going to watch what Jerome Powell says. The public has no clue when Jerome Powell's going to talk next or what he's going to say or that he'll even talk or that will even lo lower interest rates. Uh, the ones that do care are the ones that care about the market. On the other hand, you know they're going to get grief for the, doing this right before the election, especially if they go on a double... Right. And I know that the, yeah. that doesn't factor. It's all yeah. they don't pay attention to that. They, they right. do what they have to do. But it's a judgment call here. And also inflation is still above target, Mike. And I know that, that yeah. the signs are increasingly looking like it's coming back down to earth, but mm -hmm. they can't be too sure. And they've been wrong before. Yeah, but the Fed funds rates massively above their target. Right. So, <laughs> OK, inflation is a little, little bit above. The, the Fed wants to really keep like a neutral rate in the twos when it comes to Fed funds rate. Right. And right now they're in the fives. So that's a much bigger difference than where CPI's at. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. Uh, and there's no guarantee uh, on anything here. But, you know, as Powell has said in the past, if you, if you wait until inflation's already back to 2%, you've probably, you know, <laughs> waited too long. Waited too long. Uh, and so there is some, you know, some, uh, uh, I think, usefulness of having a forecasting, uh, a forecast-based uh, monetary policy. And uh, while inflation's still a little above uh, target, uh, unemployment's probably getting a little above what they, um, you know, think is consistent with full employment. So right now, as I said, you got risk to both uh, employment and inflation. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, you you can always reverse course if um, you know if it turns out uh, that that one of those. Although risks they really is don't want to do that. 
So I like him. I definitely like him. I, and I love him to read me a bedtime story because he could definitely put me to sleep easy. Next one up here, three stock lunch, target ExxonMobil in top golf. Three stock lunch today. We asked our trader to check our teams and see which ones he loves or hates. With our trades is Bor Schlossberg, managing director of FX strategy at BAK Asset Management. So first Schlossberg. off, wide receiver pick, target Boris. What's your trade on target? Love Target. Target, I think, is back. It's, you know, it's the preeminent merchandiser. I mean, it's the only place in the world where you can go for a half gallon of milk and come back with three um, outfits and a pair of slip-ons you didn't know you needed. Um, they've done a couple of things that I think are really, really good right now. They have really improved their logistics. They've improved their digital commerce quite a lot. The app is working really well. And they went to private label brands. I bought like five button-down shirts. Love them. I think you probably will love them too, Tom. So I think Target has bright future ahead of it. They're back in business. Uh, love the trade. So of our whole list, you like Target. You also like Exxon Mobil, Boris. Right, Why this one? Energy has not always been, especially this year, the best trade. Yeah, I, I think this is a uh, widows and orphan stock. Great company. I think ICE is uh, here to stay as much as EV uh, has evangelists for it. I think ICE is still here for quite a long time. And ExxonMobil is obviously predominant sector leader in the energy space. Um, they've done really, really well. They, they, they're doing $1.3 billion out of the uh, Permian Basin right now. They, the market is very excited by their Guyana development, which has 11 billion possible uh, recoverable barrels all going right. on. All of this is really good relative to the fact that we have all this tension in the Middle East and Russia, so I think they're in a very strong shape. All right, and let's go ahead and pull up valuation on Target and Exxon Mobil. Alrighty, looking at 1000xstocks.com, compare feature here. Looking at showing 12 month P on Target, just over, or just under 17. Exxon Mobil's a little under 15 here. Forward P on the baby is about 13 versus about a 17 on Target. Two year out forward P is about 14 on Target. Exxon Mobil's about 11. I would say both. I like both. Uh, Target and Exxon. <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm going to buy these stocks uh, because there's much better opportunities out there than Target and Exxon Mobil. But what I'll say is I like both of these stocks. I think both of them could be money makers over the next few years. Earnings per share growth expected to be very strong for Exxon Mobil. Uh, don't be surprised if uh, oil price comes back, I would say, fairly strong next year and into uh, future years as well. So I actually like. Exxon Mobil, pretty decent here. So, and Target is a really good name. I always like Target. So, yeah, no, not bad, not bad. And then let's hear about Top Golf. Wait, it's my kicker, Top Golf Callaway Brands. It's the one that we want to talk about. Sorry. What's your trade on Top Golf Callaway? <laughs> Sorry, Dom, it's it's buying a cashing knife. It's a, they think golf is a disaster right now. They're facing a lot of macro headwinds. They they've got it down quite substantially. A lot of people maybe want to buy it as a um. Uh, because I think all the bad news is in it. I don't think so. You need to wait a little bit to see if golf kind of recovers. Golf also has a lot of competition now. Pickleball on the up end and, you know, extreme sports and uh, uh, video games on the lower end. So it's kind of hard to get uh, motivated on the macro side for golf. So I think, you know, they have a lot of problems ahead of them. I'd rather wait and see until they, they recover before you get I along. I hope you're stock. right, Boris. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, talk golf could get interesting. So let's imagine a scenario here. I mean, could there be a scenario where Top Golf goes down to one or two dollars and starts pricing in bankruptcy? That could happen. The the way that could happen essentially, imagine unemployment rate starts to really tick up like crazy in twenty twenty five, right? And all of a sudden, everybody's like, "Oh, the recession! It's hitting! It's here! The Fed's not lowering fast enough!" And next thing you know, it's ugly. We know we get a major sell off in the market. And stocks like Top Golf would get sold exceptionally hard in that sort of situation. Additionally, people would start just flooding out of anything that is seen as higher risk, higher debt, anything that people would feel like would need capital infusions. Which you know you could put Top Golf into that that sort of you know uh, bracket, that sort of conversation. And next thing you know, stocks all send down to a dollar, two dollars. And then maybe it's worth a flyer at that point in time, right? It's kind of like just a crazy risk reward. It's like if it doesn't go bankrupt and they make it through, I mean, my gosh, you know, and they get back to a $10, $20 stock and you're buying at a dollar or two, I mean, that's pretty crazy ROI, right? And so it could be worth like a 1% position or a half a percent position. So in, in some sort of scenario like that. So I don't know, like, well, we'll see what happens there, but it is one to kind of keep an eye on and it's one that could end up being really, really attractive if... 
things went really south in the economy and the stock just got absolutely wrecked again. Market Navigator, managing the NVIDIA trade. Display. He's ready to explain what happened with that NVIDIA strategy and what we should do about it now. Tony, what can you tell us? Yeah, Dom, what we did that back then is we bought a September 123.110 put spread for around $3.75. And earlier this morning, it was trading at around $9.75. That represents about 160% return on that put spread. But going into the job numbers tomorrow, I think it makes sense to actually adjust this strike price now, basically rolling down the, the debit spread to a lower strike price. I'm advocating going down to the same expiration, but moving it down to the uh, 104.92 put spread. So very similar to the tr trade structure we put on uh, last week, but we're just recentering it based on the current price because Nvidia is now trading around that 107 level versus that 125, 126 was trading at about a week ago before that earnings report. All right, and so how much is this trade going to cost? So you realize that? Uh, I apologize, guys. I thought this was going to be talk about NVIDIA's fundamentals. It looks like it's an option exercise Trade. Here. You know, we saw the job numbers last month cause quite a bit of volatility in the semiconductor space. I think that we could potentially see some softness going into the job numbers tomorrow, especially if you look at the JOLTS data that came out earlier this week. You look at the Fed survey number here for August, showing fair amount of contraction in both manufacturing and services. I think we could see a, a, another a disappointment tomorrow, and I think semis getting hit is likely going to be, to be a, a trade that's going to play out with that type of theme. So, which is why I'm I'm playing this. I, I'm moving the strikes lower here and trying to get further protection for Nvidia, or as, especially if you're invested in this particular stock, this would be a good way to potentially protect for further downside. And Tony, again, this is what traders like yourself call a debit spread. It means you pay out for it. It means the most that you can lose is the amount of money that you paid for the option strategy. And then what is the upside? Can you tell us from there? Yeah, so in this particular case, you, we have a $12 wide debit spread that we're paying $3 for. And that means you have about $9 of potential profits or $900 of potential profits versus $300 worth of risk. So you have about a three to one risk to reward ratio if NVIDIA is below $92 at expiration, which is in about 15 days or so. Yeah, so NVIDIA under 92 in 15 days from now, I mean, it's possible, but uh, do you really want to bet on that? I don't want to bet on that. Like, sure, it's possible, right? But I mean, you got Invi you got Jensen going to speak at an investor conference next week, right? What if he says something like really positive that no one really saw coming, right? What if he says something about demand that's much better than people expect? Like, you don't know. Like, and all of a sudden the stock's 110. Like, and you need it down 92? Come on, like... You know, you got to kind of say what's more realistic probabilities. And when you're playing with this short term stuff, man, it's tough. Or you need the market to go down a bunch. I mean, come on. All right, next one up here. Donald Trump will lower corporate tax rate to 15% for companies making products in America. Uh, yeah, let's get into this. One. Club of New York, let's bring in Eamon Jabbers with the headlines. Eamon. Hey there, Kelly. Take a live look in now. The former president uh, is taking some Q&A at the Economic Club of New York. Uh, as we're talking right now, he's wrapped up his prepared remarks uh, and is talking to the audience there. Uh, the former president engaging in sort of a lengthy discussion here uh, during the hour or so of his remarks about tariffs, tariff policy, giving a bit of a history lesson about uh, former President William McKinley, who... Uh, hey, he went to New York. I thought he didn't like New York. Trump views as an underrated president saying that tariffs work, uh, they bring down costs over time, they protect American industries for the long run, and they generate revenue for the U.S. government. Uh, he also announced that he favors a 15 percent corporate tax rate, but with a catch. Take a listen. My plan calls for expanded R&D tax credits, 100 percent bonus depreciation, expensing for new manufacturing investments and a reduction in the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 15 percent solely for companies that make their product in america so that last part is the key kelly and we'll have to ask the campaign exactly how they're going to find that but the former president saying yeah yeah here's the issue how the heck do you define that companies that make their products in the united states of america okay so Starbucks, does that count as, uh, can they get their corporate taxes lower down to 15%? I mean, technically they make their product in the United States of America, right? It's not like they're making those, those coffee somewhere else, but I'm going to guess the coffee beans are not going to be grown in the United States of America. 
And so therefore, does Starbucks count as a 15% or no, right? I'm sure there's going to be other things. What if there's, uh, what if they order some fancy espresso machines from Italia, Italia, Italy, right? Uh, then do they get the 15%, right? What if, what about, let's say it's an American uh, manufacturing company, they make espresso machines, but let's say there's a few parts that just aren't available in the United States of America. Does that company have to then create those parts in the United States of America? Or what if some of their parts are from some some other countries, right? Do they count as the 15%? What if it's 99% of the product, but it happened to be assembled in the United States of America? Also, what would it count as assembled, right? What if it's made in China, but then it's just like, it's two pieces and you just put it together and like, oh, it's assembled in America, right? Because we like put it together like a sandwich, whatever this thing is. There's so many question marks. So is that realistic, the 15% for things that are made in America? No, no, it's not. They'll never go through. Could he get 15% corporate taxes for all go through? That's potential. This is sound. This is like one of those political things that like, oh, it sounds so cool. And I agree, like, oh, it sounds cool, you have 15%. But then you actually go through the reality and you realize this is impossible. This is impossible to do. So that would never end up, end up happening. But uh, corporate tax going to 15%, that's possible. That would definitely be a big help to the stock market. It's another six percentage points that would go to companies rather than the government. Um, I don't know if it would be the best thing for government deficits and those sorts of things, but it would be a positive for the stock market. But it wouldn't be nearly as positive as the last corporate tax cuts rate, which was 35 uh, down to 21%. So, But uh, yeah, I think it's good political th- Theater, it will get a lot of people to think like that would actually happen, but that would never actually happen. They could get 15% corporate taxes. That's a possibility. But it's a good way of pitching it, right? Because the problem is on the Kamala side, on, on the Harris side, right? They're pushing back about, like some of their big points they push back against Trump is like Trump's just is trying to help out the billionaire corporations, the billionaires and the rich and those sorts of things, right? So that's where they always push back. So then Trump can kind of come back with this and he says, no, no, I'm not just trying to help the companies. I want companies that manufacture stuff in America. That's who I want. And so it's just a big game of politics, right? Even if these things are unrealistic and both sides do it. Like Harris has plenty of stuff that she's never going to get past. Unrealized tax, <laughs> unrealized tax gains. No, that's never getting passed. And Trump has plenty of things. He is like he's a 1%, less than a 1% probability you get passed. And this is one of those things. He favors bringing corporate rates down from 21 to 15 yeah, percent. That 15 percent only goes to companies that manufacture their products in the United States. So we'll get some more guidance on the details around all that There's from no, the campaign. No but uh, clearly, just a caveat here with all the Harris proposals that are out there on tax and all the Trump proposals that are out there on tax. These are proposals during a campaign season. These candidates would have to get elected and then pass them through Congress, uh, the, the makeup of which is unclear right now, uh, before any of that can become law. And it was fun, by the way, to see Becky and Larry and some of the journalists uh, sitting up there with him. But, Eamon, we're clearly getting to the policy stage of this campaign cycle, and the betting odds will now reflect probably voters weighing uh, the more, much more the nitty-gritty of what these uh, the two of them would actually do. Do we think there's more gap emerging now between their policies when we've heard previously when we were talking more broad brushes that um, they were both in some ways flip sides of a coin. Yeah, I mean, look, these are uh, emotional appeals, really, what you're seeing on the campaign trail. I mean, the former president uh, beginning his remarks. Dude, both sides are just saying whatever they can to get votes. I'm not going to lie to you guys. They're both just saying (laughs) whatever like at this point in time i'm looking at both of them and they just are throwing shit out there they're just throwing it out there like vote for me vote for me please 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 denouncing kamala harris saying that the united states is in the midst right now of what he calls an economic nightmare uh so you know they're they're real emotional uh hooks here uh but they're trying with these various policy prescriptions to to rope in specific groups right the former president here very clearly speaking to corporate shareholders, saying we're going to lower corporate ta- taxes. That's going to be good for you. It's going to be good for the stock market. We saw Kamala Harris with some of her proposals speaking specifically uh, to Silicon Valley, perhaps by suggesting that she's going to deviate from some of President Biden's proposals. Uh, you know, they are very much micro-targeting with some of these specific proposals, even as they're engaging in these overall emotional appeals to yeah. voters more broadly. And it, we're still waiting to hear from the Biden administration if they are going to try to block the Nippon deal for U.S. Steel. I know that was something Trump and, Bo- and Harris have both also said that they would like to see done. Yeah. Amen for now. Thanks. Okay, next one up here. Oh, no, that's it. Oh, my gosh. I thought we were still rolling. We're not rolling. Okay, guys, appreciate you joining me as always. Thank you so much for being here. 
Thank you for being subscribed to the channel. Always fun. Uh, if you're looking to access 1000xstocks.com, as well as get access to my private stock group, private wealth group, I'll put that as pinned comment down there today so you can get access to all this stuff. And other than that, definitely check out this video. That'll help you guys out immensely. 16 years of stock market advice in 52 minutes. That was a video I put out over Labor Day weekend, so not everybody got to see that one, but you'll definitely enjoy that one. That one is on my main channel over there. Much love and have a great day.